Hi, everyone. Uh, it's four o'clock, so I will get started. So welcome back to the final portion of the 2021 Virtual Neuroscience Retreat. It's my honor to now introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Bo Chen. Dr. Bo Chen received a BS in microbiology at Sichuan University, China, and then went on to the University of Miami School of Medicine to receive a PhD in pharmacology. He later pursued postdoctoral training in the Department of Genetics at Harvard University. He was previously an assistant and associate professor in the departments of ophthalmology and neuroscience at Yale University School of Medicine and is currently an associate professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Here, he is the director of the Ocular Stem Cell Program and is affiliated with the Department of Ophthalmology, the Department of Neuroscience, and the Department of Cell, Developmental, and Regenerative Biology. He received the Carl Chris Jessner Foundation Award for Retinal Research and was a Pew Scholar in the Biomedical Sciences from 2013 to 2018. He is a reviewer for many journals, including but not limited to Science, Neuron, eLife, PNAS, and Journal of Neuroscience. Dr. Bo Chen's research focuses on mechanistic and therapeutic studies of retinal degenerative diseases caused by loss of photoreceptors or retinal ganglion cells. To study these conditions, his laboratory pursues two main strategies, neural regeneration and neural protection. So with that, I will hand over the mic to Dr. Bo Chen. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, uh, for introduction and uh, uh, thanks everyone uh, for inviting me uh, to give a talk here. And uh, I'm very happy uh, uh, to talk about our research. Uh, can I share my screen now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, my lab uh, has been uh, uh, investigating uh, uh, how to regenerate new retinal neurons and protect the old retinal neurons uh, with the ultimate aim to restore vision in the past 10 years also. Retina is a piece of uh, beautiful neural tissue in the back of the eye. And uh, there are layered structure, uh, a lot of like uh, the layered structure in the brain, uh, but it's more accessible, it's part of the CNS. In the outer retina, uh, there are photoreceptor cells, uh, photoreceptors, uh, two types of photoreceptor cells, uh, rod photoreceptor cells and cone photoreceptor cells. Photoreceptor cells are, uh, the light sensing primary sensory neuron and the immediate first step in vision. Uh, so the, there, are, there are several class of interneurons, bipolar cells, amicron cells, horizontal cells. They relay uh, visual information from photoreceptor cells to the output neuron uh, retinal ganglion cells. The visual information is summarized in retinal ganglion cells and uh, sending the information from retina to the visual cortex in the brain by the long axon projection from the ganglion cells in the optic nerve. In the retina, uh, so the outer retina photoreceptor cells and the uh, retinal ganglion cells, these two types of uh, uh, neurons are most vulnerable to the uh, genetic defects or the environmental factors. The degeneration of photoreceptor cells and ganglion cells underlies the visual loss uh, in the major retinal degenerative diseases. So photoreceptor cells and uh, the ganglion cells, these two types of neurons, retinal neurons, are in great need to be saved, protected, or be replenished. A lot of uh, retinal degenerative diseases are uh, chronic in nature. nature. Uh, so they progress slowly over years or decades, or even decades. Uh, take the age-related macular degeneration, for example. At the first, the very early stage, uh, the patients may not notice any vision loss. The survey appeared to be normal. Over the course of time, they started to notice uh, their vision become blurry or fuzzy in the central, uh, in the central area. Uh, over time, the, the symptoms became uh, 
worse and exacerbated to the advanced stage, where there's a irreversible, irreversible vision loss uh, in the central uh, in the center of the visual field. So this irreversible vision loss is uh, is devastating because we rely on the central vision uh, for daily tasks, driving, reading, work, everything. Uh, so the the progress loss of vision. Uh, in, in, in the central retina is because of the uh, gradual loss of light sensitive cells in the macular region. So here she was in the macular region that is in the center of the retina. Uh, so they are photoreceptor concentrated region. Uh, so over time, uh, the loss of the, uh, the, the retinal cells in the macular region leads to progressive loss of the vision. So we can uh, imagine in order to save vision or restore vision, uh, we can either slow down or prevent cell, cell death, uh, retinal cell death, uh, using uh, uh, strategies to protect those neurons. Or we can generate new retinal neurons, and those neurons can integrate it into the retinal circuitry and restore vision. Uh, so these two strategies, uh, uh, they, uh, they can be used. Uh, early intermediate stage. Uh, however, in the advanced stage, because there's uh, most of the neuron lost, so there is nothing to be saved. So the neural regenerative strategy become probably the only uh, available uh, optional uh, therapeutic uh, strategy to be used. So in terms of uh, generating new retinal neurons, the uh, regenerative uh, strategy, uh, there are main, two main types. Uh, one is a stem cell transplantation. Stem cell transplantation involves the induction of uh, stem cells, either embryonic stem cells or the iPS cells into retinal neurons and transplant the uh, stem cells into the retina. And uh, hopefully the, the transplanted cells will integrate into the host retina and restore function. On the other hand, uh, there is another strategy we can think of uh, we can uh, induce or activate the endogenous resident stem cells in the retina. So with the, the strategy is to, to, to push the in situ differentiation of our own resident uh, stem cells in the retina. The question is, do we have uh, the resident stem cells in our retina? The answer is yes. Uh, so here is a schematic of the retinal structure. So the, uh, the retinal neurons, outer retina, rods and cones, and the inner retina and uh, the uh, inner uh, interneurons and uh, the ganglion cells, output neurons. As you can see here, these cells uh, in blue, so they, they are mutual glial cells. Mutual glial cells are primary glial cells in the retina. So they have the, the processes going up and down uh, across the whole thickness of retina. As other glial cells in the central nervous system, Mutual glial cells, their major function is to provide nutritional uh, structural support for retinal neurons. And there is a hidden function of mutual glial cells. So because mutual glial cells are a potential pool of retinal stem cells. However, the regenerative capability from mutual glial cells uh, differs dramatically uh, across species. In zebrafish, uh, mutual glial cells have the full regenerative capability. When there is a loss of retinal uh, neurons, any type of retinal neurons, mutual glial cells can replenish, can regenerate all the lost retinal neurons and restore vision function. In mammals, uh, uh, any type of mammals, uh, young lynx, lab mice, and humans, we lost the regenerative capability from mutual glial cells. So mutual glial cells, when there is a loss of the retinal neurons due to the degenerative diseases or the, uh, or the uh, environmental damage to the retina, mutual glial cells are very quiescent. So they do not uh, re-enter the regener regenerative state to replenish lost neurons. So let's take a look at uh, how regeneration happens in mutual glial cells. For example, if we use the uh, very strong, uh, intense light uh, damage to the, uh, to the zebrafish retina. So 96 hours after light treatment, 
all the photoreceptor cells. So remember, photoreceptor cells, they are most abundant and the immediate first step, in, uh, first step in invasion. Both rod photoreceptor cells labeled by rhodopsin immunoreactivity and conopsin labeled by bluopsin uh, immunoreactivity here. So the both rods and cones are, are the, 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 they are lost, they died. However, uh, miraculously, so three days after light, uh, after loss of photoreceptor cells, those photoreceptors have been regenerated. So only three days, you can see most of the rods regenerated and a lot of cones also regenerated. So this is very strong and uh, robust regeneration from, from, from the zebrafish retina and neuropenil cells. So what happens in the, uh, the retinal regeneration in zebrafish retina is because when there is a uh, death signal, so here is light damage, leads to the cell death of photoreceptor cells. And mural glial cells depicted here, they can sense the, uh, the de either death signal or loss of cells, and they re-enter cell cycle, basically re-enter the stem cell state, manifest by the cell proliferation. So as you can see here, one mural glial cells, they can undergo multiple rounds of cell division, generate uh, mural glial cell derived cluster of daughter cells. And those daughter cells go ahead and differentiate into, into, uh, into rod photoreceptor cells here. And uh, so this is very, very, very robust regeneration. Uh, and one mutual glial cell after, after multiple rounds of cell division can generate many, uh, many retinal neurons. <clears throat> However, in mammals, uh, in mice, rats, in uh, so those two species are used most in the lab. Uh, the labs, uh, many labs have been using this to study, uh, to trying to unlock the regeneration in mammalian mam retina. Uh, so the good news is, uh, so although th these mutual cells in, in the mammalian retina are quiescent, they don't regenerate. However, this regenerative machinery still is, is exist. Uh, so labs uh, uh, been showing uh, they can damage the retina in the in the in in, in the mice or rats. Uh, so the the most commonly used damage is the MDA induced excitotoxicity. Uh, so if you use the uh, MDA damage the retina, so the most uh, of the retinal output neurons are dying. Uh, so ganglion cells, amicron cells, some amicron cells dying. Uh, and uh, you can see here some, not all of them, some uh, mutual glial cells re-enter cell cycle. So that is the first of regen, first step of regeneration. So they re-enter cell cycle, make, making more cells. Uh, and uh, so, however, as you can see here, so after the NMDA induced excitotoxicity, uh, the vast majority of retinal ganglion cells showing here the, in the uh, GCL layer, ganglion cell layer. They are, they, 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 uh, they are undergoing cell deaths labeled by tunnel positive red signal here. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, so those uh, dead retinal ganglion cells, cells cannot be regenerated in the first place. So although this, uh, this damage demonstrate uh, the regenerative machinery still exists in mammalian retina. However, using the strategy of the damage, uh, relying on the retinal damage is counterproductive for regeneration as the, those retinal ganglions so output neurons, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the loss of them without regeneration leads to permanent uh, loss of uh, vision. So we started uh, the regeneration uh, research by asking uh, very simple questions. So if the uh, retinal injury can active mutual cells to enter cell cycle. Uh, if we know exactly what the signal is, uh, can we act directly activate the signaling pathway uh, in mutual glial cells, thus bypassing the injury? And uh, so this way, we don't kill retinal ganglion cells at all. So we can protect the vision from the first place. We've been uh, looking at uh, um, quite a few signaling pathways, uh, those candidate, uh, as candidate uh, of the injury-induced signals. Uh, wind signal pathway is one of them. 
Uh, wind signaling pattern is very well studied. Uh, the wind signaling is important uh, for the maintenance of the stem cell population and also is a very uh, important, play important role in the self renewal of the stem cells. Uh, as you as you may know that uh, the, uh, the, the we, we have adult stem cells uh, uh, in, in, in our even in the brain, the uh, ventricular zone, and also uh, in, in the microvilli, the small cell, uh, uh, small uh, stem cell dish, uh, in microvilli and small intestine. So we, uh, we, we think that the wind signaling uh, pathway is a very good candidate to take a look. <clears throat> Uh, so here is a uh, classical wind signaling pathway. So pay attention to beta cantinin because this beta cantinin is uh, effector uh, protein of the wind signaling pathway. Uh, in the absence of the uh, wind ligand, so beta cantinin is uh, is complex in the destruction complex. So in this destruction complex, beta cantinin has been constantly phosphorylated. Uh, so this phosphorylation leads to beta cantinin ubiquitination and uh, degradation. Uh, on the other hand, in the presence of the wind ligands, uh, beta cantinin is released from the uh, destruction complex and translocated into the nucleus and activate uh, 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 target gene uh, expression. So we started by uh, looking at uh, the uh, activation of signaling by the MDA induced the retinal injury. Uh, and we actually found this uh, wind signaling has been strongly activated uh, uh, very at a very short time after uh, after MDA treatment uh, injection. Uh, as you can see, uh, within 12 to 24 hours uh, after MDA damage, multiple wind ligand expression uh, is being up, up regulated. Uh, on the other hand, wind antagonist the DKK1 and WIF1 has been downregulated. So the upper regulation of wind ligand and down regulation of wind antagonist indicates the wind signaling is being activated by the retinal injury. Next, we ask, uh, what if we block wind signaling pathway where well, the, the injury still activate the mutual glial cell proliferation? Uh, the answer is no. When we use drug to block wind signaling, the AMDA activation of mutual cell proliferation indicated by EDU incorporation assay is dramatically decreased. So that means wind signaling is indeed is required for the injury induced uh, uh, mutual glial activation into the uh, reentry into the uh, into the uh, cell cycle. So next we ask uh, uh, this uh, the uh, this question right. So as I mentioned before, can we bypass the retinal injury to directly activate the mutual cell proliferation using the gene transfer techniques? We use beta cantinin because beta cantinin is the, the effector protein of the wind signaling pathway. We use the AV mediated gene transfer that is very specific for mutual glial cells. Uh, so we, well, after the, uh, the AV mediated gene transfer beta cantinin into mutual glial cells, as you can see, uh, mutual glial cells re-enter cell cycle labeled by EDU, and uh, this uh, these EDU labeled cells are mutual cell uh, uh, marker cycling history positive. And normally, mutual glial cells the 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 soma of mutual glial cells stay in the center of the retina, but after cell cycle reactivation, mutual glial cells they they migrate up and down uh, 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 across the retina. So this behavior is uh, very uh, reminiscent of the behavior of retinal progenitor cells. So during the early development, the retinal progenitor cells they 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 move up and down uh, uh, the retinal uh, uh, the the different layers uh, as they undergo in different phases of the cell cell cycle. Uh, so this is good news. Uh, this tells us uh, beta cantinin uh, wind signaling activation. Uh, we can uh, we can do gene transfer, activate that signaling, and there is no need for injury to activate mutual glial cells. So then, what's downstream of wind? Uh, we look at the downstream signaling of wind. Uh, uh, there uh, there is multiple uh, potential target of wind signaling. Uh, Lin twenty eight uh, is uh, is uh, playing a very important role. Uh, in the stem cell uh, is a is a is a is a stem cell factor is playing an important role in regulating uh, the stem cell pro 
pretty flourishing and uh, they maintain the homeostasis of, of uh, stem cells. Uh, however, uh, the study of lean 28 uh, in the many retinal mural glial cells, uh, uh, it, we, we don't know much about it, uh, what lean 28 do in the mural glial cells in the many retina. So, uh, so lean 28 might be the downstream uh, uh, effect of the wind signaling based on the studies from the stem cells, but not the mural cells. So we went ahead and to, uh, to look at the lean 28 expression. Uh, normally uh, without uh, uh, activation or with activation. As you can see here, uh, without uh, uh, gene transfer of beta cannon to activate the wind signaling, uh, there is a there is a lung detectable, very minimum expression of the DIN28. Uh, uh, there are two isoforms, DIN28A and B. But after wind activation, you can see the MR level on the left uh, is upper regulated. And also on the right, you can see, uh, so in the normal retina, uh, the lean 28 protein level expression is undetected. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very low. So this makes sense because this is stem cell factor in the, in the mature retina, there's nothing about proliferation. Everything, everything uh, is, uh, is at a terminal uh, uh, mature stage. However, when we activate the, uh, uh, the wind signaling by gene uh, transfer beta catenin in mural cells, you can see the uh, uh, expression of uh, uh, the intuitive protein uh, in mural cells. And you can also see some mural cell migrate. Uh, so the mural cells uh, migrate into the photoreceptor layer. And uh, so the next we ask the question, so is this activation of uh, uh, the lean 28 by beta cantina is it direct on the uh, transcription level or is it indirect? So we did uh, the chromatin immunoprecipitation assay and we found on the lean 28 promoter, there is there are two prominent binding sites for beta cantina uh, on the uh, uh, close, uh, very proximal site uh, to this uh, ATG on the lean 28 uh, promoter. And uh, so when we, if we mutate this binding site, uh, beta cantina uh, is no longer be able to activate this pr promoter. So in this promoter assay, reporter promoter assay, you can see Without beta cantinin, there's no promoter activity. So with the uh, beta cantinin, DIN28 reporter is being activated. However, if we do the same uh, experiments, but with the mutated binding site the, of the for beta cantinin, the beta cantinin no longer to activate the reporter. So that means uh, indeed the activation of the DIN28 by beta cantinin is directed at the transcription level. So we further did the, the genetic analysis using the uh, conditional knockout mice of the 28 uh, knockout mice. So we knock out in 28. Uh, so after knockout in 28, beta cantinin no longer be able to uh, stimulate mutual glial cell proliferation. So up to this point, uh, we identified a signaling pathway, a uh, wind uh, signaling pathway uh, downstream uh, acting through lean 28 that's regulating the proliferation of mural glial cells. And uh, also if we activate in this signaling pathway, uh, we can bypass retinal injury. So the, the, the interesting question next is, are new neurons being generated uh, after the uh, wind activation? So mural glial cells, uh, they re-enter cell cycle like zebrafish, so those daughter cells differentiate into retinal neurons. And uh, so we found a subset of uh, cell cycle reactivated mural glial cells express markers for retinal interneurons, such as PAC6, uh, as you can see here, this is the EDU positive uh, cell cycle reactivated mural cells, they express PAC6 here, and they express syntaxin 1, like these cells, and new N, these cells. Um, so, so one thing is, um, only a subset of mural cells, they can express marker for retinal interneurons. Uh, when we probe uh, with a panel of uh, uh, markers for retinal photoreceptor cells, none of the cell cycle reactive mural cells express marker for photoreceptor cells. So this tells us, unlike in zebrafish, cell cycle reactive mural cells, they can 
automatically differentiate into uh, photoreceptor cells. Uh, in the mammalian retina, uh, mutual glial cells, although they, they, they re-enter cell cycle, but they do not differentiate into photoreceptor cells. So this led us to, uh, uh, to do a second step gene transfer. So we need some, uh, some push to further reprogram uh, mutual glial cells to photoreceptor cells. Uh, so we uh, so we went back to the uh, developmental studies to look at what are those transcriptional factors that are playing an essential role uh, for the cell fate determination or differentiation of photoreceptor cells for retinal progenitor cells. And there are three prominent factors, and OTX2 and CRX. These two factors are playing a, a very, very important role uh, in directing um, retinal uh, progenitor cells into the photoreceptor cell fate, both rods and cones. And NRL is another transcriptional factor that is playing an essential role in determining uh, the, 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 the uh, differentiating paths to rod photoreceptor cells, but not cone photoreceptor cells. So we use a combination of these three factors, OTX2, uh, CRX, NRL, to do a second step reprogramming to guide the differentiation of uh, mutual glial cells into photo, rod photoreceptor cells. And uh, we are, are, are very happy to see uh, only with the uh, cocktail of the three transcriptional factors, not, not individually or in pairs, uh, we can see uh, single mutual glial cells, the undergoing rod photoreceptor differentiation. So we put the reporter of the rod reporter into mutual glial cells. Uh, so if the mutual glial cells, the, the undergoing uh, rod photoreceptor differentiation, they turn on the reporter, uh, the, the TD tomato signal. As you can see over time, in the early time, the mutual glial cells, these mutual glial cells turn on uh, the, the reporter, indicating they probably undergoing rod differentiation. And over time, you can see uh, Specifically, uh, in the intermediate stage, one mutual glial cells divided into two mutual glial uh, two cells, two daughter cells. So upper cells. So there's a, this is soma of the upper cells as the lower cells. These two cells are still connected to each other. So these upper cells, they 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 started to express features of the rod photoreceptor cells, as you can see uh, by the arrow here. Uh, they started to grow outer and inner segments. So these are the very special features for rod photoreceptor cells. So, and then uh, between two to three weeks later uh, to, to, to enter the terminal stage. So the two daughter cells are completely separated from each other. So the upper cells, uh, the morphological, like, like a mature rod photoreceptor cells, uh, these segments, uh, cell body, and it looks like they have the enlarged uh, Bhutan, the synaptic con connections to the uh, contacts to the second order neurons. And the, the, the other daughter cells, they turn off the, the reporter and the remain uh, is no longer red, but remain as mutual glial cells in, in, in green. So we look at the, 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 uh, the different areas of retina. It looks like the regeneration of the rods from mutual glial cells uh, it's not particularly in any uh, specific region of the retina. So it's pretty uh, uh, uniformly across the different quadrants of the retina. The, the question is, uh, so the photoreceptors, uh, rod photoreceptor cells we generated, are, are they functional or not? Because the rod photoreceptors are, are, the, uh, are the primary sensor neuron uh, compared to cones, uh, rather, photoreceptors are more sensitive to uh, to light stimulation. Uh, they are they are even uh, capable of responding to a single photon uh, stimulation response to that. Uh, the reason rod photoreceptor is so sensitive to rod uh, to uh, to light stimulation is because they have a very specialized uh, 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 cellular structure, as uh, you can see on the left. So they have the outer segments uh, with a stack of membranes. Uh, so the, these stacks of membranes uh, contains photopigments, such as rhodopsin, and other proteins. Those, those proteins uh, and the rhodopsin are very important. Uh, they are uh, 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 they, they they started this chain reaction called phototransduction. Uh, so they are capable of converting light into 
into the, uh, the, uh, the, the electrochemical uh, signal in, in, in photoreceptor cells. Yeah, and in here, the outer segment region, light signal is being converted uh, into the electrochemical signal. And so they then uh, connect to the inner segment. So inner segment is full of mitochondria. So because the rods are uh, so active, they require they have a uh, big demand for energy. So this inner segment is full of mitochondria to satisfy the energy demands for the rod photoreceptor cells. And also, uh, a rod photoreceptor has a um, very typical ribbon synapse. Uh, uh, triad ribbon synapse the connecting the second order neurons, uh, horizontal and bipolar cells. Uh, so then uh, in order to see if uh, the ultra structurally the new photoreceptor cells, in order for them to be functional, they, they, they need to have these uh, specialized structures in order to sense light and uh, the mm -hmm. transmit uh, the, uh, the light information. So we use the uh, uh, electron microscopy uh, transmission uh, TEM to look at uh, uh, the uh, the new new rods, uh, so the the uh, and you can see here, uh, so the uh, immunogold labeled new uh, new rods uh, is sitting right next to the native rods. So this is the outer segment region. They have the stacked membranes. Looks very similar to the to the neighboring native rods, and also the inner segment region. So this is the native rods. This is the immunogold lab labeled new rods. They're full of mitochondria, so the, the, they, they, they can provide energy. And also uh, in the, in the syn synaptic region uh, to the connection to the second order neuron, you see this uh, electron dense uh, ribbon synapse. Uh, this is very typical for rod photoreceptors and in uh, close contact with horizontal and bipolar cells. So the so ultra structurally, so these new rods, um, looks very similar to native rods. The question is, are these new rods able to integrate into retinal circuitry and to restore visual function? Uh, so here is the whole visual pathway. So here's the retina. So re re retinal, the visual information is summarized in the retinal ganglion cells and passing uh, through the uh, optic nerve, through the relay center, several relay center in the brain, eventually reach the visual primary visual cortex. Uh, so in the visual cortex where the, the uh, terminal, the final processing interpreting of the, uh, of the, visual, uh, the, the visual, uh, uh, visual information takes place. Uh, so we did a, a collaboration with uh, other electrophysiology labs to do uh, recording experiments in retinal ganglion cells and primary visual cortex uh, to test the, the functionality of the newly generated rods. In order to do that, we did the same uh, two-step reprogramming to turn mutual cells into rod photoreceptor cells in the mouse model of congenital blindness. So they, these mice are born blind, uh, although they have photoreceptor cells, their photoreceptor cells, uh, rods of cones are not functional. As you can see here, so here is the recording in the RGCs. Uh, so the RGCs, uh, either green light or UV light, uh, no light response uh, recording in RGCs. However, uh, after reprogramming new ROS generated in, the, in these mice, uh, so the RGCs re responding uh, to both green light and the UV light, and the, uh, they're more sensitive to green light stimulation than UV light. So this, this, this is very similar to the response to native ROS because native ROS are more sensitive uh, to the green light than UV light. <clears throat> And uh, then we look at the, the, the uh, visual stimulation, the uh, visual cortex by uh, doing the uh, VEP, visually uh, evoked potential recording. As you can see here, uh, so in the control, the uh, unreprogrammed uh, mice, uh, so after light stimulation is quite uh, flat, there's no uh, light response in the visual cortex. Uh, however, in the in the after new uh, new rods being generated, uh, light stimulation leads to the response in the visual cortex. Uh, uh, as you can see, compared to the wild type response, uh, so the not every light stimulation uh, elicited response in the visual cortex, and also the response is quite delayed. So here is the quantification of the recording the uh, in the visual cortex. Uh, so this tells us. Uh, so we can uh, regenerate new photoreceptor cells uh, 
and uh, uh, can regain uh, vision. Uh, but uh, the the regain of vision is not still. There's not a room to to improve. It's still not 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 uh, normal compared to the wild type. Uh, so the challenge is uh, so. The partially the reason uh, we think is uh, because uh, in zebrafish, one mutual glial cells, they can uh, undergo multiple cell division and generate many uh, rod photoreceptor cells. Uh, so, uh, so be very, very uh, robust regeneration for, for capacity regeneration. However, in mice, as you can see here, uh, after the first step reprogramming, the cells are undergoing only one, one cell division. So only two daughter cells are generated. And also uh, one daughter cells uh, generate two daughter cells, one remain, uh, the one daughter cells uh, remain as mutants, the other become rods. So maximally there's only one rods can be generated from mutant cells. And also not every mutant cells are responding. So the regeneration efficiency is quite low. And the bottleneck is the, the first step of uh, cell, uh, uh, cell cycle reentry. There's no multiple rounds of cell division. So we started uh, by looking at other uh, signaling and other factors that can, uh, we can do better to activate the first step of regeneration uh, to ask, uh, hopefully ask mutual cells to divide multiple times. Uh, so this is a, another factor is called ASK1, also MASH1. Uh, so this uh, this factor is quite famous. Uh, so in uh, there there is beautiful work from uh, uh, from Daniel Goldman lab uh, in zebrafish and Tom Reese lab uh, in mice uh, demonstrate uh, ASK1 is uh, is playing a, a very important role in activating uh, uh, mutant glial cell proliferation. Uh, and uh, so we all, you know we started to look at the ASK1. Uh, uh, by itself, because we tried uh, so hard on the wind signaling, but there's only one cell division. So we tried to use uh, to manipulate ASK1 uh, alone or in combination with uh, beta cantinine to see if we can better activate the mutant glial uh, proliferation. And uh, so in this specific example, uh, we use ASK1 mediated gene transfer uh, to to do gene transferring uh, of ASK1 in mutant glial cells. So in combination with not with beta cantinine, but in combination with growth factor treatment, we see a much better uh, proliferation from mutant glial cell compared to the beta cantinine gene transfer, as you can see, uh, uh, as you can see here. Uh, the majority of mutant glial cell, I cannot say every mutant cell, but uh, the vast majority is being activated to reinter cell cycle. And if you look at uh, uh, the EDU labeling closely, uh, you can see regions that uh, a, uh, these EDU labeled cells lining uh, in columns. Uh, so this is a feature of the uh, uh, progenitor cells. They undergoing multiple rounds of cell division. So all these daughter cells align, uh, align vertically uh, across the retina. So this is the indication of the one mutual glial cells giving, uh, giving rise to multiple cell division. Uh, so they, they, this, uh, this research are still ongoing. So we're trying to uh, I, uh, examine the signaling part mediated by ASK1 and also this uh, then uh, second step reprogramming uh, uh, done uh, using ASK1 mediated uh, activation of mutant glial cells. So with that, uh, I'm gonna switch gears to, to talk about uh, uh, our work on the uh, protecting of old retinal neurons. Uh, so you may, Remember uh, these slides before from uh, uh, my talk earlier. Uh, so the MDA uh, induced excitotoxicity has been widely used to activate mutual glial cells. But however, the bad thing is that it kills ganglion cells. They cannot be regenerated in the first place because ganglion cells cannot be regenerated in the first place. So it's it's very very important to protect the ganglion cell from dying in the first place. Uh, if this, if we protect ganglion from dying, uh, so we can preserve function. Uh, so the different uh, uh, for ganglion cells compared to other ret uh, retinal neurons. So the other retinal neurons, their synaptic contents are very local. So retinal ganglion cells, uh, so they are output neuron retina. So their soma uh, is in the inner retina, but they have really long 
axon projections from the retina into the brain. Uh, so this long axon projection is is very important to relaying the the visual information from the retina to the to the brain. So if we want to protect the uh, the ganglion, so we need to protect both the soma and the axon. We look at uh, so first we we, we started to look at uh, if the AMD induced uh, excitotoxic uh, excite kills RTCs, there must be signaling pathways that have been compromised after this injury. So we look at various different uh, signaling pathways. So the one signaling pathway we found that has been significant compromise is the calcium signaling pathway. As you can see here, so when we probe the CAMK2 activity, which is a phosphorylated CAMK2. So in normally, the CAMK2, uh, uh, phosphor CAMK2 level is very high in retinal ganglion cells uh, uh, in, in red here. Uh, however, after only two hours after AMD damage, majority of ganglion cells, they lost the CAMK2 activity. So that means the CAMK2 signaling uh, uh, is being compromised after the injury. And so then we're thinking, uh, if we can restore the campsite signaling, can we protect the gang ganglion cells? The answer is yes. So we use the gene transfer, this time not into mural cells, but directly into retinal ganglion cells. We use a multiple isoform of a CAMK2. As you can see, uh, so, so, so this particular CAMK2, this is an active form of CAMK2. If we do gene transfer of, uh, of this form of CAMK2 into ganglion cells, then MDA damage cannot kill RGCs. So this is without protection. This is, this is a with a one week after MDA damage. So there is less than 20% of RGC left after MDA, MDA damage. And after this uh, restoring the calcium signaling with gene transfer, the RGC, nearly all RGC are protected. So this is a very surprising uh, effect. And so then we look at the protection of axons. And this is uninjured retina. So this is the retinal side. This is to the uh, distal side to the brain. And this is a CTP labeling of uh, uh, anterior tracing of the uh, uh, RGC axons in the optic nerve. Uh, so after the MD damage, you see the, the axons are uh, degenerating. So the axons are gone. Uh, so when we do gene transfer of this CAMK2 to, to restore the calcium signaling, this active mutant of CAMK2, not only the, the soma are protected, so you can see here, the RGC axons are protected, the lung axon projection from the retina to the brain, they are also protected. Uh, yeah, so, so the, in mice, so the retinal R, RG, uh, the RGC axon, the projection, the the majority of projection uh, of the of the uh, uh, axons is to the contralateral uh, contralateral side of the brain. Uh, there are two uh, relay centers they, they project to. One is LGN, uh, one is SC. Uh, so we look at uh, the lung axon projection, the uh, the, uh, the uh, terminal projection into their brain targets here. Uh, as you can see here, so after the MD damage, one week after the MD damage, the, the, the RGC axon projection into the, into the contralateral LGN uh, is decreased um, uh, significantly. Uh, so this is an injured uh, situation, this is an injured situation. So if we do gene uh, therapy of this uh, uh, CAMK2 gene therapy, so the target uh, projection into the, into the contralateral LGN is also restored. And uh, of course, so the, uh, the question is, uh, so we look at the histology, we look at cells, uh, so how about the function? Uh, so we did uh, 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 the pattern ERG recordings. So this is the pattern ERG is, uh, is directly uh, 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 recorded the function of uh, the RGCs. Uh, as you can see here, uh, so the uninjured retina, uh, there's a, a prominent uh, response of the uh, of the like uh, the pattern ERG uh, response. So after MD damage, uh, in the the response is um, is dropped to nearly baseline. However, after the uh, after this uh, the the CAMK two uh, 
with protecting of RGCs, uh, the, the pattern ERG response is also uh, restored. So that tells us uh, the cam calcium signal is, is very important to maintaining the RGC survival. Uh, when, when there is an injury, the, the excitotoxicity, the, this signaling pathway is compromised. If we restore the signaling pathway, the, the RGCs are, 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 are being very strong to resist the, the injury so they can survive and they can, func they, 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 they can be functional. Uh, so this is just about the, the uh, excitotoxic damage. Because RGC death in the retina can be caused by, by disease and different type of damages. So we, we go on to ask uh, whether we can, uh, we can use this uh, uh, manipulated CAMK signaling to protect RGCs in different disease or injury models. Uh, one of the diseases uh, uh, is uh, uh, damaging the RGC causing loss of vision is called glaucoma. Uh, glaucoma is a leading cause of uh, uh, vision loss uh, uh, in the United States, uh, especially uh, with people in the older age. The primary uh, risk factor for glaucoma is the increased intraocular pressure. So the, this increased intraocular pressure pre put, put, a, put a mechanical stress on the optic nerve, leading to the degeneration of uh, the uh, optic nerve and also the uh, degeneration of the RGCs. So to answer this question, uh, the glaucoma disease, we use a microbeads uh, collusion model to uh, in mice uh, to, to, uh, to examine whether the, uh, uh, this CAMK2 signaling, if we manipulate it, can save our GCs. Uh, the way we uh, make this model, we inject the microbeads into the acute chamber of the eye. Uh, so these beads will, will be stuck between the cornea and the iris uh, to block the aqueous humor flow. So blocking the aqueous flow, flow uh, from the eye will lead to increased IOP. As you can see, this is normal IOP, but after the microbeads injection, the, the IOP has been increased dramatically over the week uh, time of eight weeks after the microbeads injection. And also uh, eight weeks after increased IOP intraocular pressure, uh, 40% of RGCs uh, died. Uh, however, when, after we, if we treat these RGCs with the CAMK2, um, uh, with CAMK2, uh, protect these RGCs, uh, increase the IOP, uh, the same condition of increased IOP, uh, the RGCs are protected. More than 80% of RGCs are protected. So that means, uh, so this IOP, uh, induced uh, glaucoma model, uh, the different uh, disease model, uh, injury type, uh, the CAMC signaling is also playing a role in protecting RGCs. Then how about the, the injury to the uh, RGC axons? Uh, optical nerve crush is a, being widely used to study not only RGCs, to study the neuronal survival and axon regeneration. Uh, because it's a very convenient model and the eye is accessible of the central nervous system, part of the uh, central nerve, very accessible. So uh, in this model, you can use a pair of the uh, forceps uh, to clap uh, behind the eyeball. So this way, uh, you damage the uh, RGC axons. And the phenotype is very obvious. Two weeks after optic nerve crush, uh, as in the other parts of central nervous system, there is no regeneration of axons. So the axons are being permanent damaged. And it's because of the uh, axons being damaged primarily first, the, the, the RGC cells, the cell bodies also die two, two weeks after the optic nerve crush. More than 80% of RGCs die. And this is a very fast and convenient model to study uh, uh, cell survival and axon regeneration. And also we can easily manipulate uh, the RGC, uh, RGC cells, the any signaling pathways by doing AV immediate injection to infect the RGCs. And then we can analyze axon regeneration uh, by CDP tracing and uh, RGC survival by the home uh, staining of uh, with some RGC markers. So as you can see here, so here is the crush side here uh, on the top, uh, top picture. 
so after after a crash, you see the axons, they, they do not pass the crash site. There's no axon regeneration passing the, uh, the injury site. Uh, earlier, uh, we found that uh, um, the AKT pathway has been uh, affected after optic nerve crush. If we uh, increase the AKT using active AKT in RGCs, then we can see the, the axon, uh, uh, regenerate axons can pass the uh, crush site. So the AKT, so previously we, we see the enhanced AKT activity can promote the axon regeneration after in the optical nerve crush model. But unfortunately, um, when we look at the RGC survival, so still most majority of RGC still die. So this is without the uh, AKT gene transfer, this is with the AKT. So there's a little bit better survival, but it's still the majority of RGC still die. So if we wanna restore vision uh, uh, as our ultimate goal, well, we, we need to promote regeneration, but we also need to protect the RGC cells from dying. Uh, so how about uh, using uh, uh, the CAMK2 signaling by manipulating CAMK2 signaling? And uh, you know, with the, uh, earlier we see the CAMK2 is protecting RGCs from excitotoxicity from the glaucoma model. How about the optical nerve injury model? And uh, also we see uh, this uh, very robust and uh, uh, nice protection and uh, very surprisingly. Uh, so if we look at uh, even long-term you know, six months after optical nerve crush without protection, uh, there's you know, very few RGC left. But after the gene transfer, uh, the single gene uh, therapy, uh, the CAMP-K2, uh, basically nearly all RGCs are, are protected. So this is very, uh, very uh, strong uh, protection, uh, uh, very nice, strong and long-term protection. and. Uh, and we, we, we didn't actually expect to see this nice protection uh, with a severe optic nerve injury. Um, yeah, so, so currently our ongoing work uh, is by, uh, by looking at whether we can uh, manipulate the calcium signaling pathway uh, by itself or together with AKT and other known signaling pathways to simultaneously protect the RGCs and axon regeneration. Uh, so, so because a lot of uh, uh, results I presented uh, are new results, unpublished results uh, from this uh, protection work, and uh, uh, I, I haven't been able to put a, uh, some. Uh, there's a, some uh, other uh, interesting data I haven't been able to put in here due to the the one hour talk. So, uh, uh, so I just uh, heard. Uh, uh, this cam K2 work uh, today. Uh, this, uh, so we submitted a paper last year. Uh, and uh, uh, so finally, uh, after a year uh, of, the, of doing the more work and also COVID uh, slowed down the, the research a little bit. Uh, so the paper finally accepted uh, uh, to, uh, to be published uh, in sale. Uh, so uh, soon, probably uh, in, in the coming weeks, our paper will be out uh, reporting the the CAMK2 in RGC protection. Uh, so, uh, so far, so I hope I uh, I, uh, I presented our work uh, in how to generate new retinal neurons and protecting old retinal neurons uh, with a uh, with uh, with a uh, be able to uh, restore or preserve vision. Uh, hopefully, our basic science research will one day be translated uh, to help. Uh, people uh, protect the vision, restore vision for human patients. Uh, with that, uh, 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 I'm gonna uh, thank uh, uh, my lab members, uh, uh, Xunzheng and Chris, uh, they are doing the work in the RGC protection. Uh, Ye and Jin and former lab member Kai are, are doing the regeneration work and the uh, funding support. Uh, thank you everyone. Great talk, Dr. Uh, Bo Chen. Congrats on having this uh, work published. I'm sure we're all excited to see it in cell soon. Um, so now if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and ask our guest speaker some questions.
Um, I, I had a question, if that's all right. Um, fantastic talk. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Could I just ask your thoughts about translating the um, Malaglia work into the fulvia? Because um, kind of in a cone dominant area, you might you might feel that you need the Malaglia to at least some of the Malaglia to remain as as Malaglia. <laughs> so I was just wondering what you what you were thinking um, in terms of how you might translate that to a to a cone dominant uh, area. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's a that's a beautiful question. Uh, uh, so yeah, so the uh, the the macular region are, are very much cone enriched, and uh, uh, so our current uh, progress basically we can uh, as uh, uh, we can uh, stimulate mural cells to become rods and uh, after uh, cell division, uh, there is uh, one mural cells that can remain as mural uh, cells. So this way, mural cell population is not going to be depleted. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the regeneration of new cone food receptors uh, is, uh, is definitely uh, is something very important. Uh, and uh, something we are uh, we're trying to, to uh, we're trying to do. Uh, and unlike rods, so the rods are only one type of rods and the uh, food receptors there in human are and it's three type of food in mice are uh, probably two. Uh, and uh, those uh, transcriptional factors regulating the uh, differential food receptors could be very different from rods. And uh, so far we're working on it. Uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to to do something, uh, to to make that happen, uh, but uh, uh, so far I, I would think uh, uh, making cone food receptor from mural cells is much harder than making rod food receptor cells. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Fantastic work. All right. <clears throat> I have a question. This is Farron. Um, Dr. Chen, I really enjoyed your talk. It's really exciting data, especially this um, more recent results with the CAM kinase 2 um, to rescue the nerve crush injury. Um, I apologize if I missed some of this, but the last slide that you showed where you had this remarkable RGC um, preservation or recovery with the CAMK2 injection, was that injected into the eye? Like, I'm just curious, like this was as a result of nerve crush, right? So then where was the injection? And then, and then the follow-up question is, what do you think might be the mechanism by which, you know, let's say saving the cells, the cell bodies, what then happens at the crush site? And then, you know, what do you think is the mechanism by which those axons might then regenerate at, you know, with this CAMK2 protection? Oh yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, so the way uh, we uh, we do the AV gene transfer is uh, we use AV2, uh, and uh, so AV2 uh, the intravitreal injection into the vitreous chamber uh, because this AV2 uh, uh, you know you 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 can put any genes you want uh, as transgene and packaging AV2. So if you do the intravitreal injection, uh, so then we will get a uh, vast majority. Uh, sometimes you can get all RGCs, most likely, uh, to to be uh, transduced. So then uh, you basically uh, you overexpressing uh, uh, the CAMK2 in, in in retinal ganglion cells. Uh, yeah. So yeah, in terms of uh, mechanism, because I didn't put any slides here uh, due to the time limits. Uh, so the CAMK2 uh, is also a very famous uh, <laughs> uh, molecule uh, gene. Uh, also uh, studied a lot in the brain as well, uh, in early memory. Uh, so CAMK2, uh, because it, uh, it's a kinase, uh, it has a lot of, uh, lot of different uh, targets, uh, the downstream targets. Uh, so one of the targets we found that is, uh, uh, that is pre pro probably the most uh, important targets mediating the RGC survival uh, is CRAB. Uh, so uh, basically after the, uh, uh, the injury, uh, either the uh, optic nerve crush or the AMD excitotoxicity, we, we not only, only see 
the, the, the CAMP-K2 activity is compromised. We also see the, the CREB activities uh, compromised. And uh, if we restore uh, the activity of CAMP-K2 by CAMP-K2 gene transfer, we also restore the CREB activity. And also we did experiments. If we block CREB using the dominative CREB, the CAMP-K2 no longer works. So that means the CAMP-K2 has to work through CREB uh, to, to, to promote the survival of our GCs. And also uh, we found if we do gene transfer of the VP16 CREB, so that is the, uh, the active CREB. Uh, so the, if we do gene transfer of uh, VP16 CREB uh, alone without CAMP-K2, that also saves RGCs. But the, the rescue effect is not as prominent as CAMP-K2, but a mediated majority of effects. Uh, so, so we have, a, so the, these are the data, uh, we have data in the upcoming paper. So uh, uh, hopefully it will be, uh, come out soon. <clears throat> Thanks. We can probably take one more question if there is one more question from the audience. Uh, if not, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bo Chen, for a really fantastic talk. And thank you to all of our speakers and award recipient, recipients and poster presenters. And for this final last part of the retreat, I'm going to hand it over to Krishnan. Um, thank you, Ali. Um, thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, it has been a really fantastic retreat and it's been um, both a pleasure and an honor to really be the um, graduate uh, or the uh, advisor um, to the uh, NGP committee. I want to actually just share one quick slide because the people that have um, put this whole retreat together, the students, um, it really, um, I think it's, uh, it, uh, it, um, uh, it's essential that we acknowledge them because they have really um, driven this whole process. So um, I think, hopefully, can people see my slides here? Um, so Ali, who you've heard, um, has been the chair of the retreat committee. Um, Kate, Soleil, uh, Jingyi, and Mark are current retreat committee members, and Brendan was a former retreat committee member who's uh, um, uh, finished his tenure. And finally, Tori D'Agostino, who is um, helps the NGP program really run. Um, if you would all join me in kind of doing a final um, um, thank you to these uh, fantastic students that I think reflect the best of our program. So thanks, uh, Ali and company, everybody. And uh, with that, my final slide is, um, this is the Memorial Art Gallery, and I hope that we will all have the opportunity to, well, uh, not hope, I will see, uh, we will all see everybody in 22 uh, in person. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>